Thanks, Kate. I've actually got five other children as well, so I've got six all together, but they're all nearly grown up. They're extremely tall. And uh, today I have my notes here on this specially fashioned note stand, and um, I've got them on this stuff. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's called paper. It's like the new thing. You, you don't need to worry about these iPads. Right, so hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. I'm sorry I haven't been before. I feel a bit guilty that I've been meaning to come, and you know how it is. It's a bit busy at Woody's, and, and I've been meaning to come and visit you, but this is my very first visit, and here I am up here, so it seems a bit cheeky to me. But um, it's a brilliant thing to talk about the resurrection, isn't it? Because it's, um, well, it, it's like, I think Philip said, it's such a privilege to talk about the res resurrection. And I've been a Christian really... I guess I've known about Jesus and known Jesus in my life since I was a very little girl. My, my mum introduced me to faith in God. And so all my life I grew up um, with Easter being a big part of our family um, traditions. And we, would, we, we went to church all my life. And Easter, I always really loved Easter. And in the church when I was growing up, my mum used to do flower arranging, because back in the day we used to do flower arranging as well. And um, she always did this arrangement in the, in the baptistry in the church, which was like the pool where people get baptised. And she would um, do this arrangement of the cloth, you know, where Jesus, that Jesus left when he rose again. And there were some flowers there. And I used to go and peer into that little tomb. And it was full of mystery to me. And um, the resurrection actually is a, is a very mysterious event, isn't it? And actually that reading, it, it brought it out, even with the mysterious music, it's a, it's a mystery. And so I was thinking, what is the question that, that you, might, you or I might ask about the resurrection? And I said to my husband the other day, I said, what question would you ask? And he said, what has it got to do with me? What has the resurrection got to do with me? And I thought, that's a good starting place. What has the resurrection got to do with you and I? Now, 2,000 years after it's, it happened, what's it got to do with us? So you've been following this story, this long way round story of Jesus um, travelling eventually to Jerusalem and this looming event in, in Jesus' life. And last week, I think you got to Palm Sunday. Is that right? And you were kind of, he was, he'd come into Jerusalem to all that praise and acclamation from the crowds. They loved him. And uh, it was a brilliant day. And so many things went well for them. And you, you left that story actually teetering on the edge of a precipice and unbeknown to the disciples the close friends of Jesus they were about to plunge into an abyss a nightmare journey that they really had no idea of what was about to unravel and so they went from this crowd of adoring people to before very long Jesus being arrested and going through this sham of a trial it's a chaotic trial you could hear it in that reading couldn't you of you know witnesses rising up and saying things and Pilate the Roman governor he kind of wanted to let Jesus off you could almost feel it couldn't you in 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 that reading he just wanted to let him off he could feel that he was innocent and but there's all these voices clamoring for his um, arrest and then his death crucify him you know, how did it go from last week, you know, the praise of all those people to this clamoring crowd saying, crucify him? And then the story just gets darker and darker until eventually Jesus winds up being taken outside the city, having been through his trial and been whipped and, and having suffered huge amounts of um, awful things being done to him. He's taken outside the city and he's actually where they think the crucifixion site was, was just a rubbish dump outside the city. I've been there, actually. And, um, and it's just a bit of wasteland. There's a bus station there these days, and it's just the place where people come and go, and they deliberately would choose those sites so that people could see these criminals and just mock them and humiliate them so that, uh, it, was, so that it was a great deterrent for crime. That's where Jesus ended up a few days after all that praise. And then eventually he ends up put in a tomb and there's a garden not very far from the crucifixion site. 
I'll just tell you a little story, because I went to Israel a few years ago, and, and um, on during a tour, you do lots of tours when you go to Israel, if you're a Christian, and we went to this garden tomb, and the garden tomb is just this, it's a beautiful garden, and you can walk around the garden and follow a guide, and if you want to pay for one, we didn't really want to pay for one, me and my husband, so we followed behind somebody else's tour, and when they got to the, the tomb bit, we we sort of separated from the crowd, and we went into the tomb, you can go right into this cave, and it's a cave that's sort of carved out of the rock, and on the side of the cave, there's this carved stone bed that fits almost exactly the description that is in the Gospels about the, where Jesus was laid after he died. And while we were in there, a couple wandered in, a young couple, and um, they were looking at it for a little while, and they turned to me and my husband, and they said, Who's, whose grave is this? And we said, oh, it's Jesus' grave. It's where Jesus was laid after he died. And they said, who's Jesus? And, um, and we said, you know, Jesus, the 2,000 years ago, the, the man that, um, that came and, um, you know, they believed that he was the son of God and, and then he was put to death by the sort of Roman officials. And they just looked so completely puzzled. They had no idea what we were talking about. And... Um, we tried to explain this story, and eventually the, the woman looked at, turned to me and she said, so what is this? Is this his, his memorial? Is this where his body is here? And uh, at that point, my husband and I sort of looked at each other. We sort of flashed a glance at each other and thought, what are we going to say now? And, um, and we just, in that little moment, we just decided and said, well, actually, no, he, he didn't stay there at all. He, he rose again. That's what we believe, that he rose again and um, they just looked completely perplexed and um, wandered off and that was the end of the story <laughs> which yeah is not how you would hope it would be is it at all but I kind of think that probably per, per, you know being perplexed is probably um, one of the feelings that was uppermost in lots of people's minds as this story began to unravel and unfold and eventually we reached that scene that um, Emily read out where the disciples are gathered in this place and can you imagine what they felt like because they had they'd all scarpered when Jesus had been arrested they'd all run off and they'd left him completely alone he'd faced the, all of that humiliation and his death pretty much alone and his friends, his closest friends, had just abandoned him. And then after the death, they'd buried him and they'd begun to regather and they were in this room together and talking and there were, these stories were beginning to circulate from a couple of their members of the women who were saying that, you know, something's happened. Jesus, Jesus isn't dead anymore. He's alive. And of course, they, half of them were dismissing the story. For one thing, the very first people to see this event and claim that something had happened were women and if you if you were trying to establish a good story in Palestine in the first century you'd never ask a woman because not because they're not good storytellers we are but actually because a woman's word was completely dismissed as irrelevant you would nobody would listen to a woman so if you were trying to get a good story circulating you certainly wouldn't do it that way but anyway these women were saying that no we've seen him and so there's some unease in that room that day. And I kind of want to put us just in that story. I want to put you and me in the story and ask you um, whether you've ever felt like your life has just unraveled before your eyes and where you've been taken, plunged, maybe many of you in this room might well have been plunged into those kind of living nightmares where everything seemed to be going well one minute and then all of a sudden... You're here in this room, and not only has your life taken a terribly dark turn for the worse, but also you yourself have behaved badly as it's unraveled. You've betrayed, or you've, you've just been so full of fear that you've done stuff that you wished you hadn't done, and you're full of regret, and you're in that room full of regret and shame because of the person that you loved more than anyone in the world who had totally turned your life upside down and touched your life with hope for a future had 
been killed, had gone, and you're in that room. And I wonder, I wonder how you would be feeling. I wonder if you can sort of sense that accumulation of shame and grief and sorrow and, and all of that awful stuff. And I just want us to sort of go into that room, I suppose, and hear some of the things that Jesus said as he suddenly appears. Now, I don't know what that moment would have felt like. On that reading, it was quite spooky, wasn't it? <laughs> and that music, and maybe it was, because they certainly thought they saw a ghost. He suddenly materialized in front of them. And they couldn't compute what they were seeing. They certainly couldn't compute because there was no such thing 2,000 years ago. But they couldn't understand at all what was happening. And, and, but the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth, can you remember what they were? What were they? Peace. Right. Peace to you. That's the first thing that Jesus said. Absolutely spot on. Because that is exactly the most needed thing in this moment, in this time, wasn't it? And that's what we need. When we are in those circumstances, particularly when we're carrying a sense of shame and grief and regret, peace is very hard to come by, isn't it? And here Jesus appears. And, you know, the innocent Jesus, who had done nothing wrong, who'd been let down by all of them, who have everyone had the most right to say, where were you when I needed you? You're pathetic. You're full of fear. You were supposed to be the ones that I was going to send out and change the world through. Look at you, shambles. He had every right to say that. But actually what he says, the first words he says to you and to me, when we are in those situations, are a peace. And it's such an important starting place for us. If we want to get drawn into that journey of following Jesus, maybe for you, you're a bit on the outside at the moment. You're kind of thinking, is there anything in this thing? And I feel like I could guarantee that one of the things that you most want in life is peace. Because we all want peace. We all know that we do well when peace comes. And Jesus offers peace right into the heart of all that failure and shame. And he can do that because he is alive. He is alive. And his aliveness means that he has conquered or overcome everything that was thrown at him through everyone's failure and shame and sorrow and mistakes, everything that was thrown at him, that landed on him as he died on that rubbish dump outside the city gate on the Friday, he'd overcome it. It's like Kate said, he'd got his life back. And he can stand there and he can say, peace to you, I have overcome. And I, I want you to hear that message of peace to you today. It's so important to hear it. Sometimes the church has done a very bad job of communicating peace. You're, you're welcome. You're welcomed into a relationship of peace. We've, done, we've not done so well with that. But Jesus, he can do that because he is actually the Prince of Peace. As Christianity began to sort of get itself a bit more organized and the early church leaders began to write stuff down and try and understand the faith that they were now following. They began to write about Jesus and try and understand who he was. They would draw from the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus had mentioned and, and they realized that he was the prince of peace that was prophesied in Isaiah, and, um, and that he was the one who, he was the lamb that was sacrificed to bring peace. And in fact, one day, Paul, who was writing after the New Testament, said, he himself is our peace. He is our peace. It's not a thing or a concept or a, or a, a feeling that you might pursue by going to a peaceful place. He himself is our peace. And that is key to understanding our faith, that we will find peace only when the presence of Jesus is with us. The second thing that Jesus said, actually, was he said, touch and see. 
He said, touch and see. He spoke to these disciples, these men and women who were full of doubt and not really understanding what had actually happened and thinking they'd seen a ghost. And he said to them, he he wanted to just meet them in that place. Touch and see, he said. Come on, feel my hands. Look at my feet. Give me a piece of fish. Let me eat it in front of you. I'm reassuring you I'm real. And I'm inviting you to come here, touch and see and understand that I'm real. And that for me is such an important part of the the good news of the gospel story. That question was posed at the beginning. Why is it such good news? It's good news because the fearful can find peace. But it's also good news because the doubters are welcome too. The people who are wrestling with faith, who whoever here has wrestled or with faith or wondered where God is in the suffering and the struggles of life, and has, has, has asked the question, are you really there, God? Are you real? Are you anywhere near me? And here is Jesus speaking right into that question. Where are you, God? Saying, come here, touch and see. And for me, it's huge significance that actually Jesus wasn't a ghost. This is so important. He wasn't some disembodied, ethereal creature who was kind of communicating to them from beyond the grave, saying, don't worry, there's life after death. That is not the point of his resurrection appearances. He could have communicated with them with a a voice from heaven. God had done that before spoken to a, uh, from heaven with a voice and those who heard it some thought it th- was thundering others heard Jesus or the father speaking he could have done that but he came here with a body and he came back into our space and time if you like this resurrected Jesus intruded back onto planet earth and he was there with a body and it's so important because actually The good news of the the gospel, the resurrection good news, is not just about some uh, good news about where you go when you die. That isn't the message of Christianity. Again, the church has sometimes messed up that. And they've, they've communicated the idea that it's just about trying to be really good and when you get to heaven, pie in the sky when you die. And But actually, you know, Jesus coming back and being a physical person eating the fish saying touch and see he is saying I have not only overcome death itself but I've overcome in life too I've come to bring you resurrection life I've gone and got it for you on your behalf and I've brought it back here into your realm the human realm the material realm resurrection life this is what it's going to look like and actually there's something quite amazing and majestic about this person who can eat fish and can be touched but also can pass through walls I'm up for a bit of passing through walls one day but that is the resurrection life that Jesus carries it's it's in this material realm and his invitation to us those of us who doubt as well as those of us who are following is is I've come to bring to allow you to conquer and overcome in this realm. So the things that draw you down into the dirt, that make you feel ashamed, the things that trap you, your fears, your hidden anxieties, the things that, that you wouldn't want anyone to know about you. I've come to show you how to overcome in this life. That's the good news of the resurrection. It's brilliant news. And for those who follow Jesus... That is where we follow, behind the one who has overcome in this life. And for Jewish people, actually, to get eternal life, Jesus offered abundant life. And they understood that eternal life wasn't something that just happened at some event in in the future. It was a quality of life that was wholeness, freedom in your mind, in your body, in your emotions, in your spirit, connection to God, life now. This is Jesus saying, touch and see, you can have this now. And I just say to those of, of us who, who are still asking questions, that Jesus behaving like that in that room is saying it's okay to have questions. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to test it. See what it's like if you put your 
finger into the holes on Jesus' hand. He welcomed Thomas, his friend, who basically said, I'm not going to believe it unless I can actually touch his, the holes in his hands and feet. When Thomas finally appears in the room, he says, come and do it then. Put your hand in my side where the spear went in. It's okay. Bring your doubts to me. And that, all I'd say to us, those of us who still are struggling with doubts, and probably all of us do at different times, is, is bring your doubts to God. Don't go away and try and work them out. Bring them to him. That's the best place. Follow them through. Question your doubts as much as you question faith. Ask where this thought will lead. Look it up in scripture. Pray, ask God. You are really welcome in the presence of God. And the third thing that Jesus said is, you're my witnesses. And he said lots of, lots of things in this period of time. He appeared to about 500 people. And the, the important thing is, is that, that they were actually witnesses they were witnesses of something real that had happened, and he took time to make sure they understood this is a real event. This has actually happened. You are going to have to fight for this. In fact, you need to believe this is really true because you are going to go on a journey now that you have no idea where you were going. Little did they know that before too long they would be dispersed around the whole world. Little did they know that... All of them, apart from one, would eventually die as martyrs for this cause. And Jesus established it so securely in them because they needed to really know this is what it is to be a witness. To be a witness to the resurrection is, is to be somebody who says, I've worked this out. I'm sure of this. I've seen something. And... I, I, it's not, I can't let go of it. It spoiled me for everything else. Jesus has come here onto this planet. I'll just tell you another little story. What time do you want me to finish soon? I could go on for a little while. Um, a few, when on my Israel trip, one of the places that you, you visit is the Garden of Gethsemane. And you come, you've gone through to lots of different places and you pick up on some of the stories of the Bible and, and some of these stories are so familiar to me because I'd read them since I was a little girl. And I'd read the story about what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus sort of struggles the night before his death with, can I actually go through this? And he goes through this great sort of agony um, as he prays and then he finally surrenders his will to God and he says, I'm not your will, but not my will, but yours be done. And we went to this place, the Garden of Gethsemane. I hadn't quite prepared myself as I was going for what I might feel, but it's a very poignant place. In the Garden of Gethsemane are these olive trees, and they are ancient. They are huge. They've got three meter width girth, you know, and they're cracked and gnarled, and some of them are split in two as if they've been struck by lightning, and they're, they kind of writhe and contort. They're incredible trees, and actually the DNA in some of these olive trees is, is as old as the, gar as, as the story of the gospel. It's 2,000 years old. They found DNA that they think was possibly from the parent trees that were there in the garden that night, and, um, and we went to see these trees, and and they're kind of surrounded by a, a metal cage and there's like a walkway and there's hundreds of people walking around and um, it doesn't feel at all holy or sacred. It just feels like a thoroughfare. But when I walked into this space, something happened to me that I just had not prepared myself for. I was standing looking at these trees and suddenly it's hard to account for the feeling that came over me that day, but I just had this overwhelming certainty that he had been there in that garden. And I knew it with my whole being that he'd been there and he'd leant against those twisted trees and I could see the scene in my mind because I knew it so well from reading it for all those years. But I could sense the presence of Jesus in that garden amongst all these people milling around that day. And I just was totally overcome with the presence of God. I burst into tears and I just 
sat there with tears rolling down my face and the guide who wasn't a Christian just kept looking at me and sort of embarrassedly trying to move the, the, the group on and I was just completely connected to Jesus and I knew with all my heart that he had been there. And I think, you know, that's what we're witnesses of if you're a follower of Jesus or if you're sensing that call to become one that's what we become. We become witnesses that God has visited this planet in the form of a human being called Jesus. C.S. Lewis used to call Earth the visited planet. That's where we are. He has come to us and we are witnesses of what happens when God comes to us and shows us what his life really looks like. And I suppose... I think you have this thing called the big idea that you visit every week. And I was thinking, what is the big idea with this little scene that we see in the resurrection story? And I think the big idea is simply this, is that for the disciples, it changed everything, seeing the risen Jesus. They no longer had a religion to follow and a set of things that they were going to try and keep up with Um, in the absence of their leader, they had a person, a presence, Jesus. They had him back. And for them, it changed everything. It changed them from fearful failures into people who, not too long after, exploded out of Jerusalem, filled with power. And Jesus said to them that day, he said, Just wait here for a little while longer because you're going to be clothed in power. I don't know what they thought that would look like. But when it happened, there was it was it was so incredible that they transformed from these fearful people into totally fearless, courageous, eloquent evangelists who exploded out of Jerusalem, changed the atmosphere of the city in a day, and then went and spread out through the whole world. And so the reality is, is that the resurrection of Jesus changed everything for them. And if it changed everything for them, then it changes everything for us who are followers of Jesus. And the question really to end up is, is have we, how much have we understood that the power of the resurrection is is beyond, is not containable in a few little behavior patterns, trying to feel peace. The power of the resurrection is beyond what most of us have seen. Recently, I felt God say just really clearly this sentence, don't think you've seen everything yet. The power of the resurrection in you makes you a healer, someone who can pray for others and heal It makes you someone who carries peace so that you can say peace to you. It makes you somebody who can say your sins are forgiven incredibly. Jesus said specifically that. You can say that. It makes you someone who carries the resurrection with you wherever you go. So that's our our challenge. And it is a privilege, isn't it? To embody in our souls, our spirits, the power of the resurrection that Jesus made possible by coming here and visiting us. That's the end. Shall I pray? Let's pray, shall we, that we would have our eyes opened to see what it actually means to be a follower of Jesus and carry that resurrection power. So why don't you just close your eyes while I pray. I'm going to read this quote to you that I think is brilliant. It's a real challenge. It says this, Because of the new covenant, the early Christian men and women were alive as no humans had ever been alive before. They were a new species. They were not of this world, and they knew it. And with their own personal identity and life course locked in, they saw a world that desperately needed to see Jesus in the flesh their flesh and they went out to live and father god i pray that you would just release your holy spirit here in this room this evening i pray that you would clothe us with power power to be free 
to be whole, to be fearless, to find healing in our souls for where we have been and the things that we have done. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Bring the peace that is beyond description. And I pray that you would just drive it down into the center of our souls so that we become men and women of peace, carrying your resurrection power. For the sake of Jesus who made it possible, we pray.